Hey guys, welcome back. This is your host, PhilPhoneOcasion.com, and today we're going to take a look on the Sharp Oculus S3. Well, it's more of a Foxconn phone than a Sharp phone, but Foxconn acquired Sharp, so I guess it's a Sharp phone now. Uh, let's start with the design where you have a giant screen. The screen to body ratio is whopping 91%, and you can see almost the entire front facade is filled up with the screen. An overall design isn't exactly innovative, as you can see some touches here and there that are benchmarked or borrowed from the other phones, but nowadays the notches are getting a lot more popular than ever. And dual camera design, this is almost like a de facto standard now, so I'm not gonna bother with it, but you will occasionally hear people asking, is that on iPhone? X. Uh, the overall build quality is actually quite good with the both front and back finish in glass. I love the sandwich glass construction and no, this is not waterproof. There is no weather protection like you shouldn't expect for a $370 phone. Now next up is the display and it's pretty good. The color reproduction and brightness especially is very good. The spec sheet specifies that it gets up to 550 nits. It actually gets brighter than that. I don't know why. The screen uniformity also is very good. The only minor problem that I have is that it doesn't have the white balance option. Performance-wise, it's got Snapdragon 630 octa-core processor, 4 gigabytes of RAM, and 64 gigabytes of storage. And it performs pretty nicely, although it's not the smoothest phone that you can find. I'm only saying this because I've seen smoother phones and faster phones. I'm not saying that this is slow or laggy at all. Launching the app, closing that, launching another one, and multitasking, switching the app between them is fast enough. And heat management also is quite good. You won't see any problems in that arena. But since this particular chipset lacks its ability in the GPU area, Area, you will not be able to run 3D games with the full specifications. The one minor question that I have is the corners on the top are rounded while the bottom ones are not. So you might want to fix that by installing third-party apps like Rounded Corner. Software-wise, it's got Android 1 platform, meaning that you'll enjoy pure Android experience while getting timely updates like security patches for three years and major system updates for two years. A few of my complaints come from the notch. Because of the notch, you get to have less notifications. Of course, it depends on how big of a display size the DPI that you set on this, but there certainly is a lost space due to the notch right there for the notification icons and the system status icons. And I'm not sure if this is an Android One thing, but there is no way to hide the notch unlike some other notch totting Android phones. And also weirdly enough, I couldn't stretch to zoom on YouTube, which is a native function. It didn't work on the Xiaomi Mi 8 either, so I guess it's a YouTube thing or system limitation, but as of time that we were shooting this video, I couldn't fill up to zoom on YouTube. However, it does have ambient display and you can also double tap to wake your screen. And there's also fingerprint reader gesture that you can swipe or swipe twice to bring down the notification bar. Now the next part is camera where you have two of them and you can fire it up by pressing the power key twice. And it's quite slow to launch. Taking the photos also take their time, especially so when you enable HDR from the option right there. Uh, overall photo quality in the broad daylight is actually pretty good. The colors are decent, details are good, but they sharpen the image way too much. I don't know why some manufacturers do that, but they did it, so it's a little bit of strain on eyes. There's also 2x optical zoom, which turned out to be better than I thought. Uh, it's got the f2.6 lens due to the bokeh effect that it has to assist with, but there was surprising amount of details, although there also is excessive and unneeded amount of sharpness. And then there's a low lighting photo that isn't too good. For the phones around this price range, I really don't want to nitpick on this, but it does have a bright lens. It's got f1.75 lens, and the result wasn't up to that level. And interestingly enough, they put some buttons on top on the notch part. This this brings out the options like settings, uh, watermark, and effects. And this one is the bokeh mode or the portrait mode or the artificial outfocusing, whichever you wanna call it. And you might wanna consider this feature inexistent. It struggles to focus, edge finishes are quite bad, and the images turn out noisy. Compared to that, selfie cam was surprisingly good. The 16 megapixel quite big lens does a surprisingly good job. In order to make selfie photos look nice, manufacturers tend to, I don't know, just blur things around. And this thing does it very nicely with the beauty mode right there while retaining enough amount of details. And there is a software enabled bokeh mode as well. And there's also four in one pixel binning, but that's a pretty common feature that takes better photos in low lighting condition and nothing special. Next up is the audio starting with the mono speaker on the bottom. Yes, it is mono speaker, but the quality is actually pretty good. It's not spectacular, but it's good enough.
One thing missing here is the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. It's getting more and more common and I usually don't get mad at this anymore. But firstly, this isn't even water resistant. And secondly, they included the adapter, which is the least they could do, USB Type-C to 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And then they included 3.5 millimeter earphones, which is simply odd. But the sound quality itself is good, although lack of sound effects whatsoever, no equalizer, no audio enhancer is a bit disappointing, but it does its job. And lastly, we have to talk about that battery and it lasts up to six hours of screen on time in my daily usage. I'm usually on the LTE network all the time. So most of you who will occasionally use Wi-Fi networks will be able to last around a day or even longer than that. And when you charge it with the Quick Charge 3.0 charger, 30 minutes give you around 47%, an hour gives you around 80% and fully charging the phone takes around two hours and 10 minutes. And the reason why I mentioned the Quick Charge 3.0 charger is because it doesn't come with it. They were nice enough to include a free gel case but stingy enough to give you 5 volts to a of generic charger so with that bundle charger you're gonna get around 30% in 30 minutes 59% for an hour and 2 hours and 20 minutes to fully charge this up and now that I told you this much here we go with the conclusion the Akos S3 is a very interesting piece it's got a very high screen to body ratio it's quite slim not that heavy and a great screen but one part that annoys me is the camera the app is buggy slow and it looks suspiciously similar to the iPhone's camera app and as a cherry on top it it sharpens the images too much. But aside from that, for $370, you get to have an amazing screen for the price, pretty solid build quality and clean Android One platform. And also the battery lasts quite long. So yeah, if you're okay with not that innovative design, lack of 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and a little sacrifice on the camera, although selfie cam is very good, you'll probably like it. So that was Sharp Akos S3. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. You can always meet us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. We'll see you guys later.